How's that? Whoa, I'm loud. I'm loud. I'm American, living in Canada, so I can get really loud. So today, um, we're going to be talking about um, how to go from nothing, from just your code to getting your code in the cloud, um, from zero to cloud, um, and how to revolutionize. Viva la revolution. Viva la cloud. We are going to revolution the way that you deploy your applications to the cloud. Okay, are we ready? Okay, so first of all, who I am, I am Ian Mueller. I, am, I work for Red Hat, and I am also a snake charmer. My, my role at OpenShift is the community manager. So I get to come and visit at Feasley, at Latino Ware, at meetups like last night's one for Elasticsearch, and talk to the community of people who are using OpenShift and who are developing tools to use with OpenShift. And I will explain a little bit about what all of this is. So as you know, Red Hat sponsors over 100,000 different open source projects. And mine is just one of many Red Hat sponsored open source projects. And we do this because we understand that the business model for creating great software is a collaboration with many communities. And so in the cloud, we have a lot of different open source projects. You will see here at Feasley people from like Jim Perrin from CentOS, like Brian Prophet from Overt, uh, who is helping us with the virtualization pieces. There are a number of um, Brazilian Red Hatters here, too, just talking about JBoss. There's some OpenStack folks. We do Gluster for storage. And at the very bottom of that is me and my Panda and OpenShift. And OpenShift is the project that I work on. And you can learn more about it if you go to origin.openshift.com. But we love our panda. So today what I'm going to try and do is talk about how applications became so complex. So complex that someone like me that loves to code, I love to code. I love c learning new languages. I learned Fortran and Pascal and Basic back in the day. And now we learn things like Python and Ruby and Node.js and Go and all kinds of things. Languages are wonderful things. And people who, like me and like you, who are developers, like to learn languages. We don't like all the complexity of deploying those applications. And that involves many people. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a concept called DevOps, in which developers and operations people start to merge the roles that they're playing. We're going to talk about moving beyond infrastructure as a service and why that's important to understand how you need more than just infrastructure in order to be successful in your application life cycle. We're going to talk a little bit then about the future of pause at the end of this and do um, some Q&A. So if you have questions, we also have a booth at the Red Hat booth. I'll be there after this speech and I can answer any questions as well as we have a number of Portuguese speakers who can also translate and answer questions. We have a number of well-trained um, in this from the Sao Paulo office folks who have um, good experience with OpenShift and so we're happy to have them here in the booth as well. So this is what computers look like the year that I was born. So back in well, we won't say when, but a long time ago. Um, computers were huge, big beasts. And they worked in rooms that had air conditioning and refrigeration because they overheated all the time. They were very big, very huge things. And we talked, when I was in computer science class, we talked more about um, the, rather than scaling out the resources, we talked about how to deal with big teams. So we were taught how to do uh, the impact of having many people working on a project together. So the book that I learned by was called The Mythical Man Month. It's a very good book still, but it 
reflects a very different point of view. So the point of view of how do you deal with having a hundred developers working on one project. And that was what we were mostly concerned with, was the communication breakdowns between developers back in the early 80s when I was starting to program and learn in university. And this is a picture from my very first job. My very first job was at Nike out of college. So Nike, the people who make athletic footwear, which I used to call sneakers. And my job was to design the patterns for the bottom of sneakers. And it was a lot of math. And what they would do is they would take the 3D design, the same software that they use for shoes, they were using to design huge aerospace airplanes, McDonnell Douglas aircraft and people like that were using the same software as I was to design the bottom of shoes. And what they would do is they would take these designs and then they would turn them and we would have to into molds. So they put the rubber in the mold and my job was to design it from a piece of paper from the graphic designer and then create a mold. So not only put the picture there, but then put the drill bits and the pieces of metal would get machined out. So I had to do all the math for the drills going in at the right angles and the right curves. And that was really hard stuff. And I loved it because it was so much great fun and great math. Today, today you can do that online. So the job that they paid me to do full time, you can go out and see a digital 3D printer in the robotics lab today and you could take that same software and almost everything that I, that took me months to create new molds and new designs for shoes and work with designers, you can now take that and with very off the shelf software, design a shoe bottom, send it to, to this Cubex or use your local robotics lab and design your own piece of rubber, piece of shoe. So in the 30 years that I've been working, there's been a revolution in the ability of software and the componentization of all the pieces that I used to have to craft individually as, as a craftsperson. So back when I started, we were more programmers, were like craftspeople, like designers and arts, and we saw ourselves as that. So what I like to say, and I wasn't the first one, is that software is eating the world. This is a picture of my video store in my neighborhood. And people like Blockbuster, which was the video store just 10 years ago in my neighborhood, now is completely shut. And now we have Netflix or BitTorrent, depending on who you're, you're talking to. And then back in the day, we were all mad because Borders came in and closed up all the small shops of bookstores. And now we have Amazon and so on. We have schools and now you learn things online. So software is really enabling this revolution in what services and functionality can be provided online and through computers. Very different than where I started. So back, um, if you, how many of you ever saw um, you've got mail. Okay. In you've got mail, the problem was that the big store was coming to shut down the little store. That was the problem in 1989. Now, the problem isn't the big store closing down the little store, it's Amazon is selling everything. Not just books, but shoes and TVs and refrigerators and cars, everything you can get from Amazon. And so now it becomes a problem of scale. So how can we manage, get our software so that if we want to sell millions of items and have millions of users, how can we make sure that those applications, which once I would do one mold and I would create one shoe style, uh, that was a one-off thing. And it took hours to render those diagrams and then even longer to drill the mold. So we've gone from that stage to where I don't want to wait five seconds for my order to be processed and my credit card to be validated. So there's a really 
a whole lot of destructive technology that's at work right now. And you, all of you in this room, are the disruptors. You are the revolutionaries. You are the, the army of developers who will take this forward in the open source world and move to the next phase of the revolution. And I want to help you get there faster. That's a good goal. But while we talk about this, it was very easy for me for, with my one application to deal with my one computer and my one set of drivers. While we got to this revolution where we are at today, application development got very, very complicated. And it got, for me, not very much fun because I love languages. I do not like web servers. I do not like database administration tasks. I do not want to set up cron jobs. I, I am not a sysadmin, though I pretend to be sometimes. Um, so things got very, very complicated. And it made for people who, craftspeople or people who love the art of programming, things got very complicated. So in order to be a good developer, you had to do both operations and development, or at least know enough about them to get your applications up and running anywhere, whether it's on the cloud or on bare metal or on virtualization. You had to know a lot more than just Python. And then came services. So this is just a very simple, um, I think this is a healthcare learning system for the state of Vermont. This is a diagram of all the different services that as a developer you have at your fingertips to add to your program and that you have to integrate. So if you have to update a patient record, it has to get validated and go through all of this for the doctor to be able to see it, for the pharmacist to be able to see it. So things get really complicated with this large scale. So if you think of what's going on behind all this web, as a developer, it's daunting. It's really not any fun. So that made a lot of unhappy developers, and I was one of them for many years. Um, and it wasn't just the complexity of the applications themselves, it was about the complexity of getting the resources. So if you are at the university or if you are in a big corporation, in order to get the computing resources, the servers, the virtual machines, you had to go through a lot of bureaucracy. You had to beg and you had to wait for them to spin up a server or to give you access to something or to download the latest version of Python, perhaps. Maybe you needed Python 3.0 and all they had was 2.7. You had to fill out a form. You had to wait. Wait is a four-letter word. It's not my favorite four-letter word. Uh, so, so that was, so you have the application complexity and then you have the complexity of getting the resources allocated. That made programming not a lot of fun. And then along came cloud and everything was good. Not quite. So what we saw with cloud was something that um, we call the consumerization of IT. So with a credit card, I could go to Amazon, I could have a GitHub repo, I could collaborate with my friends, and I could push an application up onto the cloud at Amazon, and life was good because I didn't have to wait for my resources. I still had to configure my LAMP stack, and I had to deploy myself uh, Python 2.7 or Python 3.0. I had to get the right version of MySQL. I still had to do all that stuff, but at least with a swipe of a credit card, I could get it up there, and um, I could actually move without waiting for the bureaucracy to make it okay. Unfortunately, if you are a developer inside of a Fortune 500 company or in a, a government agency, that is considered very bad for me to go around IT, around the compliance, around the um, business policies about deploying applications. That is really bad. So um, we see something that we call the rise of shadow IT. So if, I, if my boss comes to me and say, I, you have to set up a um, contest for our customers in this retail sector, um, and it needs to be done next week. I would sneak off, use my credit card. 
I'd set up the contest and I'd make my boss happy until his boss said, where is that running? And now I would be in big trouble. And so would my boss and everybody would be in trouble. So there's this shadow IT. It happens. We all know it happens. Things like Heroku, Google App Engine, the lots of tools and lots of places where you can deploy your app now um, out there. And so the big boss isn't really happy with this. So with this rise of consumerization, also what started happening was developers, people like me and like you, started to have these expectations, big, big expectations that they would have this quick service, right? They would be able to get the resources. So there was all this conflict between the developers and the IT and our bosses um, because we wanted that the latest version of Python. We wanted the latest, we wanted MariaDB, we didn't want MySQL, or we wanted um, Postgres, or we wanted something else. And we no longer wanted to wait. Okay, so there was a lot of conflict going on inside of organizations. And so what we started to see was this rise of something called DevOps, which is developers and operations. And developers, because we had to be sysadmins, started getting the skills to build those LAMP stacks, being able to test. And we got this new world order that became, um, at least I think for the most part in North America, we saw the rise of this. And in Europe, we did. And I know it's happening in Brazil here because the Red Hat folks are doing it here, where people were starting to get the skills on both sides of um, being operations and being developers, and you started to see these sort of new creatures, new DevOps people. So basically what we had was we have operations people who learned how to develop, and they were successful, because they knew how to build everything. They were probably the happiest people in this new world. And then the developers who learned just enough to be dangerous and to get their applications deployed. Um, and where they really started seeing this common ground was around the configuration management side of things because we started learning things like Puppet and Chef and tools to be able to deploy our applications. And that's really, that's like when we start to get into, that's programmable. Puppet and Chef, you look at that and you see, that's a language, I can use that, I'm a developer, I can do that. Um, and it got into, you know, we started getting a little bit happier with our... So we started to look at infrastructure as code. So we started using things like Puppet or Chef or a new one, Ansible. Um, and we started, I started using Bash and, and started working with the open APIs to take on infrastructure, almost as a, like a coding practice. So that's where the DevOps stuff started coming into play. And then something else happened. I saw someone with a New Relic t-shirt on earlier today too, but then developers started looking at monitoring tools. Here's the data nerd down in front, yes. So we started getting access to these tools from the admin side and we started using them to debug our code, right? We started using typical things, watching the throughput, you know, page loads, and we started learning a lot more, continuously monitoring these applications that we're working on. Um, and it helped us debug some of the bottlenecks um, in our, our code. So in some ways, it was great because our code was getting better. It was cleaner code before we got to deploying it in production. And this is, I think, a good new world order. But what we were learning was that infrastructure itself was not enough. So just being able to give us the, the computing resources, the VMs or the instances on Amazon or the servers in your server farms on the inside of your enterprise, well, that just really wasn't enough. Because what infrastructure gave you was your network and storage and compute on demand was great. I don't have to wait for it. I don't have to wait for the bureaucracy anymore. But basically, those are servers in the sky, right? They're not 
configured servers. They might have um, CentOS or Fedora or um, RHEL, hopefully, or some of you, I see some Debian and Ubuntu people here. So um, it might have the Linux operating system, but you're still on the hook for configuring those things. So that's where the configuration management tools, you still have to do all of that. So then came a new era, this thing called platform as a service. Um, and that gave you and gives you, and I think this is what revolutionizes the cloud, is it gives you the entire LAMP stack and configures it for you automatically. So everything you need for your application, the entire runtime, is automatically pushed with your application and spun up in the cloud and it's managed for you and it will scale it up and down. And that's the sweet spot and that's the revolutionary thing about what's happening in cloud now. So now it, it actually becomes very useful. So when I'm talking about this, um, the infrastructure layer could be um, AWS from Amazon, it could be bare metal if you're running OpenShift, it could be OpenStack, it could be CloudStack, it could be lots of things at the infrastructure level. But what, as a developer, what's really interesting to me is the middle stuff. Those are the things that I need for my application beyond the compute resources. I need to have, um, maybe I'm a Node.js programmer, maybe I'm using MongoDB, and maybe I want um, Apache Tomcat. Um, or varnish and you know I want all of those things to automatically be configured to work together that's my word is automatically I, I, I'm taking credit for that one um, and I want to be able to just code my application and push it and have all of the re appropriate pieces deployed for my application so we've come full circle now so back in the day 30 years ago when I was writing code and all I cared about was Pascal or Fortran or whatever the language was of the day I think I might have even been doing some RPG um, and that really dates me but um, now we've come back full circle where I can concentrate on my code I can concentrate on using the frameworks like in Python we have Django and Flask and Bottle the ones that I love that help you enable your web applications to breathe and grow much easily, much more easy. So in OpenShift, we give you all of that. We give it to you as an open source project. So whereas someone else might have a public platform as a service, maybe Heroku or Engine Yard or Google App Engine, they're hosting it. They own all the source code behind it. They'll host it for you. They'll charge you some money to run it. And um, what we do at, at, on the OpenShift project is we take all of that magic stuff in the back that does all of that um, for you, and we give it to you as a community to use as you like. So here in Brazil, there's a company called GetUp Cloud. Is anyone from GetUp Cloud here today? I think they're working. Um, they, uh, they have taken OpenShift origin source code and deployed a publicly hosted platform as a service for all of Latin America using our code base. We also have a product called OpenShift Online and we host it ourselves. We eat our own dog food and we have over a million applications running live for the past almost two years now. Um, so you can go to openshift.com and spin up uh, a couple of free gears and use it, play with it, try it out. If you come to the Red Hat booth, I'll show you how after this. But we also, of course, we're Red Hat. We like to make some money. They like to pay for my airfare to come here. Um, we have OpenShift Enterprise. So if you are a university or a government agency or you are a um, large corporation that wants to have their own internal platform as a service, you can, do, you can take that and get a supported version of our software. But I would encourage you to try using OpenShift Origin first. Um, if you go to install openshift.com, you can, with one command, install your own platform as a service. So we've gone from that old world of the physical, having to build a server and go through all of these 20 million steps. We, we kind of jumped over the virtualized world, and I apologize to the overt guys and the other folks, but um, that really didn't help me as a developer as much as I would have liked. It didn't scale as well, 
didn't automatically scale, to the world and with pause, you have this idea in your head about some great new application that you want to build. Um, you get the budget for the credit card or your departmental budget. You get the resources, you're coding, testing, launching, you're scaling automatically, and you're failing quicker, which is great. Failing quicker is good. To fail, for, to, to find out your program isn't working quickly is a very good thing because then you can fix it and move forward. Failing is good. And um, I, this is what it enables you to do. They probably don't like me saying that in marketing, but failing is a good way to learn. So it improves IT's productivity because they are no longer having to create those servers for you, manage those services. That's what Platform as a Service does. It lets you deploy things faster. It's much more flexible. You can pick and choose which of the frameworks, which of the databases you want to use. It takes the cost down. And one of the key reasons it takes the cost down is because we're doing what we call multi-tenancy. You are sharing those resources. That's the whole idea about elastic cloud and cloud deployments is that you are sharing those resources and you'll scale up and scale down. And so instead of before where you were allocated a full server, and if your application wasn't busy, that full server was still there, costing you money, costing somebody money. And this way, in a multi-tenant world, it comes down and you are only using the resources that you need for the traffic that you have at the moment. And you're only getting charged for that. That's a good thing. As I said, um, the enterprise lets IT manage those costs. They can set the rules about how big those containers are, and it's easy to deploy um, pretty quickly. And if you use the enterprise version, you get RHEL, and you get our wonderful support and all of that. Some of the things that make OpenShift different than other open um, platforms as a service is that we use SE Linux. Anyone here know what SE Linux is? Yes, you all love it, right? good. Um, SE Linux to secure those multi-tenant containers that your application runs in so you don't get any sort of um, traffic from the other um, containers, other applications running in there. It's a very secure. It makes it very easy for government agencies to say yes to deploying platform as a service. Um, we do uh, what we call automatic scaling. And some platform as a services, what they'll do is they will add more resources to the pods, which all of them should do. This is a good thing. But we do the next step. We allow your application to automatically scale up and scale down. We have a concept called application idling. So when your application is idle, it doesn't get any, it, it goes quiet and it's not using those resources. We are the only platform as a service that does that at the moment and we are open source, so uh, you can go out and try it anytime you want. Um, there's support for Java EE, and that white space in between, for some reason right now, it says white, but it shouldn't. It says, it should say .NET, because we now support .NET and Microsoft within our platform as a service, and I think the Feasley gods didn't want me to say .NET, <laughs> and um, it just disappeared. So about uh, about three months ago, we added in .NET support for um, the platform as a service. So we create um, the containers that we create for those are have a very funny name. They're called Windows Prisons. So it's like going to jail in the Windows jail. So uh, that's there's lots of ways to use OpenShift. So if you like to use the command line, we have a great command line interface that does, um, it's built on a REST API, so if you don't like the command line and you don't like our console or you don't like Eclipse, you can write your own and I will happily help you do that. Um, but it's very easy to do from the web browser, from Eclipse if you use that, um, and a lot of other IDEs now have support for deploying to OpenShift. There are lots of ways to deploy it. Um, we have some wonderful heat templates if you're using how many open stackers in the room one okay try heat <laughs> he's also the data nerd so that's okay uh, but so we have a lot of a lot of different ways so depending on how your organization likes to deploy software we probably have a puppet module for you we have chef modules um, you can have lots of different scripting approaches to do this and we can help you that again I'll say it install.openshift.com is 
a great place to go and start and do your first origin or enterprise download. A little bit about architecture, um, but I, because I'm speaking in English, I'm not going to do a deep dive into architecture because um, we can do that with some Portuguese help at the booth. And so the way that uh, Platform as a Service works is there is, in the nodes are where your containers or your, what we call gears, and the gears are where your applications live and breathe. Those are the things that have SE Linux wrapped around them nicely so your application runs there. Um, and we have uh, what is called a broker who is watching over, he's the overseer or the health manager for all of the nodes and manages all of the gears and is doing the HA proxy work of watching your traffic and knowing when to idle you, when to scale you up based on the rules that you've set for your application. Um, and you as the developer um, have your client tools. We are very Git-centric. We create a Git repo for you on your gear where your code lives. So um, it's very good to know a little bit about Git um, Git pushes and pulls and all of that because that's what we're using. We're very much Git based, um, and that there's a repo on your gear. You can keep that, and you can keep the whole thing flowing very nicely. Um, and this is all. This is what we will manage for you at OpenShift Online. We do this for you. But if you want to deploy your own, you deploy a broker and then as many nodes as you want on the resources that you have locally. And we can go into a deep dive on that at the booth. You can also um, configure it in many different ways. There is no one perfect way. Uh, the way most people do when they start is they create, take one instance maybe on Amazon or in a VM and deploy a broker and a, no a couple of nodes and the console and they work with it that in that way. So on install.openshift.com there, the, the script that's there will walk you through a lot of all, pr pretty much all four of these top four um, configurations. So you can say I want two brokers so I have redundancy on the brokers and as many nodes as you want. The one thing um, with the .NET stuff that I will say is that um, you can't mix Linux and .NET on the same node. So if you deploy a node for .NET for Windows um, gears or Windows prisons, um, that is its own node. So that's the one thing. You, don't, you won't see Linux and, and Windows on the same node. I think it's a cultural thing. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing this. There's also ways of um, creating districts of nodes so that you can manage and move from one cloud to another entire district. So it's a very flexible framework for deploying a platform as a service and it's highly configurable. So really what we're all about taking is making sure that you at the open source communities and your, your agencies and your companies have this new power to revolutionize the way that your developers deploy applications. So we are, like I, I am a Python person. I'm not a PHP programmer. I'm not an expert in that. We have experts in Java and JBoss here, a lot of them at Red Hat. But this is really about creating a whole new world of flexibility and empowering the developers to use the choices that they have so that they can get their applications, not just um, with the swipe of a credit card, but you can manage the worlds that they're in. This is a really important thing. It's the next step from just having infrastructure is to make sure that you put a platform as a service on there because then the developers can get and deploy their applications on demand in a uh, compliant, so compliant with the business rules of your company or your agency or your school and make sure that you con conform to the right rules so they can get much more free range in a access to the resources they need. So it's all rainbows now. So really what we're talking about here is giving you the tools from OpenShift for the automation and scaling part of application deployment. All right. The other pieces are cultural and collaboration. And that's where the two worlds of DevOps come together. Is that really what we're saying is we're trying to take the struggle out of IT and the struggle with IT. So IT administrators and PaaS administrators no longer have to fight 
with developers or make developers feel bad or wait for the resources that they need, but they can do in a, in a pretty tightly, rigorously constrained way, give them access to deploy themselves. So they can make sure that everybody is deploying the same packages for, for Python 2.7 and 3.0 and that they have the right releases and they can manage that across the entire um, cloud infrastructure that they're giving access to the programmers for. So it's a very nice new world that we're entering in and it is going to change the way that we look at and the way that we can get back to being, I say, um, it's, an, it's equivalent to the industrial revolution. It is the next phase of de development in the cloud is to have this level of automation and scaling autom automatically available to you as a developer and in compliance with what IT and the sysadmins want. So we're freeing up them from having to worry about building these VMs or building these servers for us because we use the magic of PaaS to do it for us. So you can go from idea to code to production in just a few minutes and to get your application up there in a test environment. The other really cool thing about this is because you're using this automated process, you know that the environment that you're building, you're developing in, is the same environment that's going to get built for the test and the QA team. And it's the same one that's going to be in production because you're using the same tooling to create your development environment and to create your test environment. And the QA team isn't trying to recreate what you created on your desktop. There's all this automation that flows through and it completely changes the, wall, the walls that were there before between the different groups in the um, organization. So you can go much more rapidly to production and the bugs they find won't be bugs in missing packages or missing pieces. It will be bugs in your code, which is a good thing. Like I said, failing is a good thing. Um, failing faster is, a best, is the best thing. So automate to win. That's the key best process, process here. Um, so whenever you see someone building a cloud, tell them that they should be adding a platform as a service and they should use Origin because it's open source and it's available and it's in production and being used very well. You plan for today and you're also planning for your future needs because you can add new frameworks and languages very easily to OpenShift. It's an extensible project so we have the Origin code that is the core of it but we have this metaphor that is called cartridges so if a new language go plus two or go away or something like comes out. It's very easy to add a new cartridge into that framework and into that automation. So it's, if you put the platform as a service on it today, you are future proofing the automation and the life cycle to, in years to come. And basically you're leveraging your same skill sets. All right. You're making it easier. The sysadmins are now become PaaS administrators. They are administrating the rules and applying the rules and managing the platform as a service. They know how to do that. And you are getting to be a really amazing programmer and really concentrate on the pieces and the art of coding that um, we all know and love as developers. So a little bit about the future of PaaS. How many of you have heard of Docker? Yes. How many of you have created a Docker image? One in the back, yay! Because everybody's heard about Docker. It's a wonderful thing. Um, the concept that we have of Gears and of Linux containers, the next generation of that is called Docker. And there's a huge movement started in Silicon Valley, has spread across the world like wildfire, not wildfire, wildfire, not wildfire, that's another project. But basically what it's doing is it's taking the concept of gear and those containers to a much more flexible uh, scale. And so what in the next coming releases of OpenShift you'll be able to do is take your application, put it in, drop it into, a, build a Docker image and deploy that in OpenShift. So that's gonna be a very interesting world. So now, right now we support Linux and .NET and the Linuxes we support are RHEL and Fedora and CentOS. Right. The Docker image, we don't care what's in that container. So you Debian guys, 
you can all put Debian in there and we will manage and scale your application inside of that Docker image. So it is the next generation of gears will be Docker images. And there are already hundreds of thousands of Docker images being built today um, and we'd be able to share those and use those and deploy them in OpenShift. That's probably six to eight months away but it's coming very soon, so I would advise you all. There's a couple of, on the OpenShift um, website, there are some very good blogs that explain how the relationship is between OpenShift and Docker and what the road ahead is. So that's definitely something that's on our roadmap, and um, there are other sessions here, I'm sure, at Feasley on Docker, besides the one the guy in the back probably is giving. Um, so that's, that's something to look forward to. So Paz services, I would be, um, the real deal is just to align your goals. Make sure your ops people and your development people that they're talking together because the new world is basically DevOps. There really are the operations people, because the infrastructure has become so programmable, they're becoming developers and developers, vice versa, they are also becoming operations people. Platform as a service really just takes that to the next level and automates all of that. I'd be remiss if I didn't say a little bit about Red Hat Consulting. We have a wonderful office in Sao Paulo and people all across um, Latin America and Uruguay and Peru, I saw Alex was here before, um, that can help you. Uh, there are the Red Hat training vouchers because there are also, and you do not have to take OpenShift courses with these training vouchers, but there are three great, or, yeah, three great courses now, or two courses and one exam that you can take that will teach you everything you need to know about OpenShift. There's lots of other things you can do, but I would suggest the OpenShift. Um, and you can reach, reach out and Roberto, wave your hand. Roberto will um, tell you how to get to anything you need to know um, about services around Red Hat here in um, Latin America. He's, he's your man. Um, so there you go. Are there any questions? If not, that's the end of my portion. And now, I didn't check if anybody tweeted or anything, but Roberto, why don't you come up here and, and let's see. You bring a few more vouchers, all right. So thank you, guys. Oh, so Twitter went down. You were so good that Twitter went down. Yeah. You crashed Twitter. Twitter error. That's good. Twitter errors are good. Let's do this. Yeah, I'll log in on it. Here, I'll let you do this. <laughs> it's your machine. It's his machine. I'll let him do this. Okay.